ladies and gentlemen, this is Brandon, also known as Super Fanboy Guy, and I welcome you all to the third episode of our podcast called The Golden Guardians Versus System Podcast, where we talk about competitive decks in the Golden Age format, and with me, as usual, is the Robin to my Batman, Mr. Jacob Wheeler. Jacob, how are you doing today? Hey man, what's going on? Oh, I'm doing well. Thanks for once again joining me on the third episode. I think in our previous two episodes, we got a lot of good feedback, and I think we have a show that people enjoy, and we've been getting a lot of feedback, so thank you for everybody who's been providing feedback. Now, before we get to our topic for today, I just wanted to kind of go over some things well, over that we didn't really go over in our last episode. And if you tuned up, if you tuned in with us on our last episode, we were talking about the Spider Stall deck. And the three things I just wanted to bring up very quickly is that we were talking about in the FAQ, what are some cards that hurt the deck? And Jacob and I actually forgot to, we didn't really go into full detail about this one, but the Mr. Sinister 5 drop, uh, the no a team affiliation was also a card that could potentially hurt the deck. So, Jacob, thank you for clearing that up with, with us and the in the viewers. So yeah, that's definitely. That's definitely an important card to mention. And I thought, because I thought when we were talking about it, we thought that the three-drop Mr. Sinister, the Famine one from Marvel Evolution, was the one that we were talking about, but I didn't realize it was the five-drop mostly. But the three-drop could work in theory, but the five-drop is just a better choice. So wanted to also just kind of just talk about that briefly. Yeah, the five drop, um, you know, it's many decks run this five drop, uh, Mr. Sinister. I mean, it, it seems to be a staple in most households that, that play versus for sure. Okay. And although there are kind of ways to play around it with Spider Stall, but yeah, I mean, because you could do stuff before the combat phase, I would assume. So if you yep. wanted to activate like your Puppet Master example, you'd have to do it during, before the, oh, during, or before the combat phase. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah, yeah, most most of the abilities can actually be activated um, outside of the combat stuff. Right, exactly. Okay, so that was, yeah, that was the first thing on the list I wanted to clear up. And then the other thing I also wanted to clear up was I mentioned in the podcast that the Spider-Man, the Spider gets around the uniqueness rule, but I guess I got some feedback, and I, I actually didn't know about this, but he doesn't actually get over the uniqueness rule because he's still Spider-Man. So, I mean, it doesn't really matter in my version of the deck where I was talking about him because we have the Scarlet Spider so you can just reveal him and play him if you need to and just you know that's just a like a, a workaround to get around the uniqueness rule so thank you for everybody who you know messaged me or left a comment about that clarification and then the, the last thing I wanted to talk about was apparently uh, I did some more play testing and I actually found out because one of the things that I mentioned was that the Spider-Man, the spider was if you don't get him by turn one or turn two, then, you know, he becomes useless during the game and you're no more Mr. Nice Guys become irrelevant at that point. Well, a potential uh, combo you can do is you can discard a card for Aunt May's alternate recruit cost and then, oh, on turn one. And you can actually grab Spider-Man the Spider and shift them on the same turn. The only disadvantage with that is you're obviously down a card. So by turn one, you have, I believe, like three cards in your hand. But that is a potential way you can kind of make that play a little bit more consistent. And we didn't really talk about that much, about that combo much in the last episode. So I just wanted to bring that and... I don't know, Jacob. Was there anything that you wanted to add about start, uh, Spider Stall before we jumped into today into today's topic? Um, I don't. I don't think so. the The Golden Age meta, you know, it's it's kind of really hard to to narrow it down, right? Um, you know, you have Spider Stall, and and I think a lot of people may misconstrue when we say that these decks are like really good. That doesn't mean that they're unbeatable. And that doesn't mean that you can't splash in some things to in your own deck to make the matchups a lot easier. So I think that, you know, uh, oh, like hypercritically looking at each deck and saying, oh, this is the best. Now this is the best. 
Um, I don't think that anyone's really going to get that out of any of these golden age podcasts. The, you know, these are just, these are just ideas that we have and, and in our testing, what we found to be the most efficient with, with each deck choice and everyone's, uh, everyone's experiences are going to be definitely different for sure. I also have one more thing that I want to mention on the podcast. You know, we talk about things that we think in terms of rulings that we think is correct, but you know, you know, we're only human pun intended. Um, <laughs> so we may make mistakes, you know, during the podcast cause we're not maybe clear about the rulings or we just haven't played the cards enough to really understand them. So, you know, we're going to make errors like that on the podcast. We, we try not to, but you know, you can't help it sometimes to just make mistakes. It's just human nature to do that. So I just wanted to tell everybody that, you know, we're not, we don't live in a perfect world, so we're going to make mistakes here and there, you know, every once in a while. But we do thank everybody in the community that, you know, post comments on the YouTube channel or maybe, you know, say in the collective that in the in the collective uh, Facebook group that, you know, we're kind of wrong about certain things and they let us know. And then we look at the ruling. So thank you, everybody, for your feedback on that. You know, what's interesting is uh, and I, I don't mean to cut you off, but, mm -hmm. you know, what's interesting is that this game really has lost you know tournament support right because mm -hmm. uh, upper deck entertainment isn't really managing anything anymore nothing's being printed anymore and really since 2008 from my understanding and a lot of people have come into this game and attempt to play competitively after years and years and years after um, this game has lost support so it's not like magic or Yu-Gi-Oh, where we can go into a room of you know 170 plus people and and start you know conversing about rulings and things like that and having that experience with tournaments so um you know it, this is this is to be pretty common with a card game that's been discontinued for sure yeah i don't know like i go to when well when they used to have grand prix going on i i would change that 170 number you just mentioned to like maybe in the thousands <laughs> because I, i'm used <laughs> yeah. to playing at that big level stuff but okay so yeah so we got that since we got that out of the way, let's move on to our topic for this episode. And if you tuned in with us on the on the last episode, we at the towards the end, we decided to do the Brotherhood deck. Now, Jacob, you have a Brotherhood deck that you're going to share with us for the deck profile. And I actually have a Brotherhood deck that I'm going to briefly go over, but my deck profile can be found on my YouTube channel. And I'll post a, a link in the description on YouTube. but And I'll kind of go over briefly some of my combos. But I already have my deck profile, uh, like I said, on the YouTube channel. But Jake is going to go into details uh, about his deck in the deck profile. And so, Jacob, is there anything that you want to say about this Brotherhood deck before we jump into your deck profile? Uh, yeah, when I was uh, first starting to pick this deck up, I realized that um, decks like Spider Stall and, um, you know, Reign of Terror, uh, decks that ran Reign of Terror, um, this this deck, uh, the Rever Reservist Brotherhood deck, was really the main focus when you're looking at a meta. And I feel like, I feel like this is the centerpiece to what a meta really looks like. So if your playgroup or whatever local tournament you're attempting to do has a deck that's being ran as the next new brotherhood um or tnmb you know you're gonna start seeing decks like spider stall come out of the woodworks to combat this because the deck is so strong um it's very very fast and it's very aggressive so yeah and so the decks that we've talked about we talked about mega city right and mm -hmm. that deck could be kind of aggressive or kind of a control deck do you agree yeah, it's it's like a mid range. It can go it can go either way. A very good deck, yeah. And then Spider Stall is definitely more of a stall control deck. And I think this Brotherhood deck that we're gonna talk about today is gonna be like a straight up aggressive. You know, it doesn't have any your well your version of the deck anyway. It's very aggressive. You know, the point is to kill you by, you know, an early turn and kind of stuff like that. Now the build I have. Um, that's on my YouTube channel is more of a control build. And also the, the build on my channel is considered to be a modern deck, whereas this one is a golden age deck. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's all I want to say about the two different decks. But if you have nothing else to talk about in the introduction, let's, uh, we could go straight into the deck profile. Yeah, man, let's hit it.
Okay, so I have some good news. There's only nine characters in this deck that are outside of the Marvel X-Men set, which is really good because, you know, the later sets can be quite pricey. This deck is relatively cheap on the character side as, as opposed to some of the other, like, top Golden Age decks. So jumping right into this, uh, we've got four Tempo Heather Tucker. Uh, this is from Marvel Evolution. Uh, she's a Marauder and Brotherhood character with Reservist. So e each character in this deck is going to have Reservist. When Tempo stuns a character, that character can't ready this turn. She's a 2-0, two, 2 attack, 0 defense. And there's going to be four copies of her. Next, we've got four copies of Rim Ram Acolyte. Uh, he's a Brotherhood Reservist from Marvel X-Men. He's a 1 attack, 2 defense. And when you recruit him, you can reveal the top four cards of your deck. And you can put one of the revealed reservist character cards from your hand, or uh, and put it into your hand, and then put the remaining cards on the bottom of your deck. Next, we have Klein Stock Brothers Acolyte. There's going to be four copies of this card. He's Brotherhood of Reservist. He's from Marvel X Men. He's a two attack, one defense, and you can reveal a face down resource named Klein Stock Brothers. And Klein Stark Brothers gets plus two attack this attack. And you can only use this power once per turn. Moving on, we've got one copy of Barnacle, Acolyte. He's a Brotherhood Reservist. He's from Marvel X-Men. He's a one attack, one defense. And Barnacle gets plus one attack for each character adjacent to him. But those characters that are adjacent to him get minus one attack. And last for our one drops, we have one copy of Mystique Raven. She's in Marauders and Brotherhood Reservist character from Marvel Evolution. She has uh, all character names while in your hand deck or KO pile. She's a one attack, two defense character. Moving on to our two drops, we've got um, and I, I don't really know how to pronounce this, so I mean you guys are gonna help me. I don't know if I don't know if you know how to pronounce this. Uh, is it is it Unician? I have no idea how to pronounce it myself. <laughs> so help somebody helps us in the comments of YouTube. <laughs> Yeah, somebody help us out. You know the like the when you go to look a word up on Google or something, and it it shows you like uh, kind of like how a dictionary would do. It shows you a weird way of spelling it that helps you with your pronunciation. Somebody do that for us because I have no clue how, how to pronounce this. But we've got four copies of uh, Unician Carmela Unician, and I'm sorry if I butcher that name. Uh, she's from Marvel Evolution. She's a Marauders and Brotherhood character with Reservus. She's a three attack, two defense with range, and Unician gets plus two, plus two, while an opponent controls a stunned character. And uh, she's going to be one of the stars of the show in this deck. She's extremely powerful early on. Another star of the show that we have is, um, and, and I believe I'm pronouncing this right as well, um, four copies of Amelia Vo, um, Acolyte. Marvel X Men characters is is that right on the pronunciation? Yeah, I, th I think it might be it might be Vought, but I don't know. Again, don't hate us for mispronunciation because we're <laughs> that's not why we're here. We're here to give you guys the cards and what they do, and yeah. <laughs> right. I mean these these words don't even really exist. I don't think, but I I don't know. Who, who knows? Who knows? Um, but yeah, she's she's a Brotherhood character, reservist, two attack, three defense. And what's cool about her is you can reveal two face down reservist resources you control, not named Amelia Vo, rather than paying Amelia Vo's recruit cost. And this is really interesting because you can basically play her for free, and you can also play her from from your resource row with the reservist ability for free. And then you can play another two drop character or two one drop characters. So your turn to play, if you've got the cards, can be pretty explosive here. And also, one thing I want to mention about Amelia is, after seeing your deck list, I think she is probably the most expensive, one of, well, actually one of the most expensive cards in the deck. Um, and I think she's like close to $10 a pop right now. Yeah, she's she's up which, there, which for is, sure. Which is like shocking to me, because I didn't know she was like that much. So, And obviously the foil is probably worth more, but... Yeah, she's she's great, man. Um, that that free character, you know, it's you can't beat it. It's pretty incredible. Next, and and this is this is one of my favorite three drops in the deck. Um, some people like the other one, but there's three copies of Sinyaka Acolyte. He's a Brotherhood character. Uh, Reservist is from the Marvel X Men set. Five attack, four defense with range, 
And whenever you recruit a non-army character from your resource row, target opponent loses two endurance. You can also boost Sinyaka for one and play him as a four drop, and he'll get plus one attack for each face down resource you control. You've seen Sinyaka before, like in in some lists. Oh yeah, absolutely. Back in my day, I used to dra- <laughs> I used to draft this guy. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, cool. I remember. I remember drafting. I drafted, uh, you know, the Brotherhood Reservist deck, and playing him was pretty good. Yeah, that burn really adds up for sure. So next on the list, we've got three copies of Joanna Cargill, Acolyte. She's a six attack, six defense from Marvel X Men brotherhood she's got reservists and she has a little bit of a downside um so the great stats for a three drop six six but she gets minus one attack and minus one defense for each face up resource you control and we're gonna go ahead and move now what's up hey jake before you move that uh there's something i want to talk about joanna for a second and this is this is something very important that i need to bring to our audience's attention okay everybody who's listening to me this this is going to be the best piece of advice I'm going to give you about Jonah Cargill. Or Cargill, whatever you pronounce it. Okay. Spend the money to get the EA version of this card. If I find anybody with the regular non-EA <laughs> version, I will hunt you down, take it out of your deck, and rip it out. There is no excuse why no. you shouldn't play the EA version of this card. It looks beautiful and it is, you know, Jonah Cargo is going to be the only card that the EA, you're only going to play it in this deck or like another brotherhood reserve deck. So that you have no excuse to not get the EA and put it in your deck. <laughs> I am very, yeah. I am very <laughs> passionate about that. Okay. So I'm telling you all get that EA and put it in your deck. If you're going to make this deck, because I will, I will find you and I, well, I won't kill you, but I will be very upset if you don't have this EA in your deck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, and she's she's so cheap, too. There's really no excuse not to. That's, is that's exactly like why, bucks? too. There is no excuse. And I think uh, Category 1's got quite a, quite a supply on there. So there is no excuse you guys should get an EA. So anyway, continuing with your deck profile. <laughs> <laughs> well, moving on to our to our four cost characters we've got uh anna marie cortez um she's she really shines here in golden age and she's a mutant mental and there's other mutants that i've i've previously uh, mentioned like rim ram but um i've seen some people run anna marie in like a mental type deck but yeah she's she's reservist eight attack seven defense from the marvel x-men set and at the start of the combat phase you can reveal a resource and if you reveal the character card your opponent cannot play plot twist with a cost equal to that card's cost this phase, which is crazy because, you know, uh, obviously they can respond by playing. So, like, if you flip, uh, if you reveal Joanna Cargill and, you know, you're trying to call enemy of my enemy, they can just respond to the effect and just play enemy of my enemy, right? What you can do is shut down pumps. Um, I mean, any pump, but from tabletop to competitive um you know, you can shut down like a what acrobatic dodge, um, you know, savage beat down, you know, things like that. Okay, so let me ask you something while we're on Anne Marie Cortez. So, uh-huh. who do you think's better, Anne Marie Cortez or the Riddler Riddle Me This from DC Legends? Oh man, oh they're so they're so different in different situations. But I got to be honest, I really like the Riddler a lot better. Yeah. I, do I hate that he's so expensive, though. Yeah, that's true. And, I mean, obviously a one-drop compared to a four-drop is, you know, significantly different. But I know I play that Riddler in my Secret Society deck. And he, I mean, you want to mill cards with the Secret Society deck. That's why he's really good in that deck. But, yeah, I still, so if you're looking for, like, an effect to make your opponent not play Plot Twist, you have your choice between Anne-Marie Cortez and Riddler Riddle Me This. Maybe not put – I'm not saying, like, take out Anne-Marie Cortez and put the Riddler in this deck, but I'm just saying <laughs> if you're looking for, like, some kind of janky deck or something that you want to have your opponent not play plot twist, that would be, you know, a card, too. So, yeah, an, an, an a honorable mention, as I may say. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, next, we got Spore, Spore Acolyte. Um, this is also going to be uh, from Marvel X-Men. He's a four-cost. Um, he's a seven attack, seven defense, 
and you can replace the reservist resource you control. Target attacker you control gets plus three attack, minus three defense this attack. And you can only use it once per turn. And I got to be honest with you, I, I may get a lot of flack for this. If it wasn't for the the disruption of the Golden Age meta and having to cover so many bases of so many different decks, I really like Spore's ability over Anna Marie because I feel like it gets you there quicker while cycling through your stuff. Um, I would totally be running four spores and two Anna Marie if there wasn't so much disruption in Golden Age. Right. Um, so moving on to our five cost characters. Um, now these two are, are really unique, really good characters. Um, we've got Sabretooth Savage Killer from Marvel X-Men. I really like this guy. Um, really high stats. He's an 11 attack, 8 defense for a 5 drop. Which usually, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're usually looking at like a 9-9 nine, nine is like the standard for a 5 drop, right? Mm -hmm. um, so he's got Reservus, and whenever a character causes Breakthrough, Sabretooth cannot be stunned while attacking this turn. And you can pay 2 Endurance, and this is one of my favorite abilities, you can pay 2 Endurance and target character you control can attack hidden characters this turn. And there's no cap to this. So if you have the Endurance, you can just have you know, your whole party, uh, you, you know, your whole team just start attacking hidden characters if that's the deck that the opponent's playing. It's pretty cool. And also, I want to talk about this for a second. Now, what you just said, remember, it's whenever a character causes breakthroughs, so that could be you or your opponent's characters, too. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, just wanted to mention that as well. It's definitely. Next on the 5-drop list, we have uh, Scanner Acolyte. This is going to be for Marvel X-Men. It's going to be a 10 attack, 9 defense with Reservist and Concealed optional. Um, and you can replace a Reservist resource you control. Look at the top 4 cards of your deck and put them on the top of your deck in any order. And you can only use this power once per turn. So obviously, you know, you're going to want Sabretooth out there for the big damage. But then there's going to come a turn after. And, you know, you don't want to be stuck with Sabretooth being your only 5 drop because of uniqueness. So Scanner definitely helps you to hit the board in the concealed area, you know, use Scanner's ability, and then you can start setting up to vomit more characters on the board um, for the next turn. But your opponent shouldn't be living that long. But just in case we get to turn six, we have an additional five drop, which is pretty sweet. So that's going to be it for the characters, and we'll go ahead and move on to the plot twist. And once we move on to the plot twist, the, the, the characters are going to make a lot more sense as to why uh, things were chosen the way that they were. All right, we're moving on to the plot twist now. So, uh, you know, this deck is called uh, The Next New Brotherhood, which, uh, you know, TNNB, which is uh, a play on both the ongoing plot, or uh, both an ongoing plot twist and a, uh, a normal plot twist for Marvel Legends. So uh, first up in the plot twist list, we have The Next Brotherhood. This is a bit of a pricey card. Um, this is from Marvel Legends. Um, if you control four or fewer resources, Brotherhood characters you control get plus two attack this turn. Next on the list is going to be the new Brotherhood. This is going to be the, the OG card from uh, Marvel Origins. This is an ongoing plot twist, and you know, it has a threshold cost of one. And while you control four or less resources, Brotherhood characters you control get plus two attack. This is kind of the whole premise of the deck. We're not really trying to go beyond turn five. And I got, I got a really funny story about um, the next Brotherhood. Uh, you want to hear about it? Absolutely. If it's okay. a funny story, if it's stories, you better believe I want to hear it. Right. <laughs> so um, when I first started picking up this deck, okay, um, I, I, I was in the military and I was in South Korea. And mm -hmm. I was looking to get into uh, more of competitive verses. But this was, this was after, um, you know, verses had, had died off, right? And so I didn't know anything about net decking um, or anything like that. Uh, I played, uh, my main competitive play was during uh, the Marvel X-Men set when like Avengers mm -hmm. and Marvel X-Men and it was like Squadron Supreme and, and kind of during that block of time. Great sets, um, by the way. Oh man, I loved those sets. So, um, I, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of experience with, I, I knew about Reservist. Avengers Reservist was one of my favorite decks. But I didn't know much about, um, you know, the older sets or, or anything like that. Because, I mean, I was a kid when we were, 
when we were looking into like doing tournaments and stuff like that. I mean, I had to have been like 13 years old or something. So, uh, you know, I was, I was proxying up some decks and things and I was like, man, this next new brotherhood list looks like really cool. So, you know, I built it, I proxied it up and I just, I was just thrashing my friends around with, with a list that was relatively similar to this. I mean, it was bad, a couple of them, but I realized later on that the next brotherhood, I was using it as an ongoing plot twist instead of the, the one effect and done. Oh. <laughs> oh man. I didn't, I didn't realize it until after I left Korea and everything. Like, so I would go like turn one, flip the new brotherhood and, you know, play tempo or Ram Ram turn two. I would kind of cycle through into the next brotherhood. And now all of a sudden I'm just getting in there for that permanent plus two. I'm just getting in there for a ton of damage. My games were ending on like turn three, turn four. So wait, uh, you you were playing with people when you were in South Korea? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there was okay. there was there was a couple people that were playing, but they weren't. I mean, they weren't really uh, very competitive. You know, it was more of a tabletop fun thing. I kind of I kind of got the group playing. It's not like we all you know knew about versus or anything like oh, that. Oh, okay, right. Uh, but yeah, I was using the next Brotherhood as as an ongoing uh, plot twist, as well as the new Brotherhood. So the new Brotherhood's correct; it is ongoing. But the next Brotherhood, it's one and done. Like once you play it, that's it. Like you're done. Don't don't play it as an ongoing. It's not ongoing. Yes. Uh, thanks. Thanks for clearing that up too. Yeah. yeah definitely. <laughs> we wouldn't want people to play the the wrong card. The the wrong. Well, they we want not. We would want them to play the card pr- uh, correctly. So our next one cost plot twist is Meltdown. Um, this is going to be from Marvel Knights. Um, it, you can choose one. You can KO target equipment or replace a face down resource you control or gain two endurance. And uh, this this deck is, or this card is in the deck for, um, it's strictly a meta call. Uh, it, it definitely helps with um, maybe uh, high voltage uh, decks like that. We'll probably cover that at a different day. Um, definitely like fate artifacts and, and things of that nature. But Mainly what you're going to use it for is replacing a face-down resource you control um, in case you get kind of tied up, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But Meltdown is definitely a meta call and, and you know, not necessarily a must-have in this deck. Uh, but there's two copies of that in there. Moving on to our two-cost plot twists, we have four copies of Airstrike. The Airstrike kind of supplements the idea of running Meltdown to replace your face-down resources. So Airstrike says target character you control gets plus two attack while attacking this turn and has flight this turn. You may replace a face down resource you control. If you replace a non-character card, that character gets an additional plus two attack while attacking this turn. So essentially you either replace a character and target character gets plus two attack and flight, or you replace a face down non-character from your resource row and target character gets plus four attack and flight. So this is kind of like your, your poor man's um, savage beat down in a way for this deck. Um, this, this kind of, this kind of helps uh, move things along and keep the machine well oiled. Airstrike does for sure. Moving on, we've got four copies of planet X. It's a team up and it's from Marvel X-Men. You can play planet X only if you control a brotherhood character. And as an additional cost to play Planet X, choose a team affiliation among characters you control. And you cross over Brotherhood and the Chosen Affiliation. That's the ongoing portion. And a subset of that ongoing portion is that you can, at any time, replace Planet X. And target attacker you control gets plus two attack this attack. Moving on to our three cost plot twists. We have three copies of Boot to the Head. This is from Marvel X-Men. And as an additional cost to play Boot to the Head, Replace a reservist Brotherhood resource you control, and target attacker or defender gets minus three defense this attack. And as our locations, we have just one copy of Hammer Bay, and this is from uh, I believe this is from the starter deck, right? From like way back in the day, the I the X Men and Brotherhood starter so, deck. But I'm not 100 percent sure. But I'll find the image of it and post it on the YouTube channel. Yeah, it's it's M- MXS is is the I'm pretty sure that's the. Um, starter decks i'm, I'm oh, pretty okay. sure hammer base says that brotherhood characters you control get plus one attack so this is kind of like a doled down version of the new brotherhood and i like to think of it as um you know one additional copy of a bad new brotherhood right 
Yeah, well, thank you for sharing your deck with us, Jacob. And uh, I'm just going to kind of briefly talk over my Brotherhood deck now if you're if you're done with your deck. Yeah, go ahead. I'm not going to I'm not going to take too long with this. Jacob's Brotherhood deck is a Golden Age deck that is in a very aggressive deck. Now, the deck that I was going to share with you today is actually on my YouTube channel. It's my Magneto Juggernaut Brotherhood deck. And if you guys want to see that deck, you know, I'll post a link into the YouTube on uh, a link in the description of the YouTube channel. And but just to briefly talk about some of my favorite combos in that deck. So we play in my deck a, a total anarchy, which is a one cost plot twist ongoing. Uh, whenever a character with cost realist becomes stunned, KO that character. And it was from DC Origins and reprinted in DC Legends. So the potential combo that I like to do with that card is with Magneto Mutant Supreme. And the combo is is that you're supposed to KO your character or your opponent's uh, three or less characters so that they have, let's say, their four costs in play so that the Magneto can potentially stun their uh, four cost character without even attacking. So that's kind of what the combo of those two cards do. And then we also have... New and Improved, which is ongoing. KO a non-army character you control. Characters you recruit this turn with the same name as that character enter the play with two plus one plus one counters. So we play Magneto and Juggernaut in the deck, obviously. So we use that to, you know, KO our four drop Magneto to bring in our seven drop Magneto. Or, you know, like like we've mentioned this card in the first podcast, the Mega City one. That Juggernaut and Weapon of Mass Destruction is definitely in my deck. And, oh, he's a monster. Yeah, he's definitely one of our favorite cards. But uh, I'm not going to talk too much about it because obviously I have the deck and I give all the details in my deck profile. But definitely this deck is it's it's more of a modern deck and more of a control deck. So if you guys are interested in that, make sure to check out my deck profile video. Also, I do have a gameplay video with this deck on my channel, and I'll add that to the description on the YouTube channel as well. But, yeah, so mine's going to be short. My deck profile is going to be short this episode. So, Jacob, if there's anything else you want to talk about your deck, I guess we'll go on to the rotation section of the episode. Yeah. Okay, so our rotation is going to be super short and super sweet and to the point. What we're attempting to do is to end this game as soon as possible, and you'll notice that there is a ton of reservists. A every card, every character in this deck is has the reservist um, keyword, right? So right. what we're attempting to do is we're attempting to get the new Brotherhood online as fast as humanly possible, preferably multiple copies, and we are using cards like Boot to the Head, Planet X, Airstrike, Meltdown, Spore's ability, and Scanner's ability to cycle through. Um, because, you know, every time you replace a Reservist resource, you take the top card of your deck and you put it in this place, right? Uh -huh. So we're attempting to do that as much as possible. And, and this kind of acts as a draw engine when everything has Reservist, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, essentially what you're doing is you're just drawing cards over and over and over again. So we're trying to cycle through and get the new Brotherhood online as soon as possible and just beat in for an absurd amount of damage. So what we'll do is um, I'll just I'll just give you a basic, basic example, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll go, um, let's say our turn one play is Tempo or Kleinstock Brothers, right? Which is ideally what we want. Kleinstock Brothers is going to have that plus two pump if we have a, an additional copy in the, in the resource row. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, a really good opening play, like perfect world scenario, would basically be this. We go tempo, and then we flip the new brotherhood, and we beat him tempo for four, right? Mm -hmm. And now we set our next turn. Our next turn, we're going to play Unisian as our two draw, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, we're going to um, beat in again, right? Because we can't reveal two face down reservist resources if we have the new brotherhood up and online, right? Mm hmm. Um, so it, there's some debate whether or not we want to open up with New Brotherhood and then a one-cost character versus having, if you have it, playing a one-cost character and then Unisian and then cheating in Amelia Bow and then trying to flip the New Brotherhood like later. You see what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Like on turn three. 
you really just got to gauge how fast you got to kill your opponent. So, um, you know, let's let's go back to our first example. We got the new Brotherhood online on turn one, and we've got Kleinstock Brothers or Tempo beating in for four. Turn two, we're going to play Unician, and then we're going to continue to beat in, right? Turn three, we're going to play um, Sinyaka. And then by now, we should be using Planet X or cheating in Amelia Vo, right? And we still have that global buff of the New Brotherhood, right? Mm -hmm. And by now, maybe we even have a second copy. So Planet X, boot to the head, right? And even Airstrike can help cycle us through for more copies of the New Brotherhood. And if you get two copies of the New Brotherhood early game, chances are you're going to win as long as you're not facing a deck like spider stall or you get reign of terror right from mm -hmm. uh from some type of crisis doom deck or something like that so now that sinyak is online when we use spore or Marie cortez on turn four we can start burning our opponent out and what's really interesting is by now you should be cheating out emilia vo and if you have an explosive like uh setup you can typically, especially if your opponent hasn't really gotten a very good start, turn four, turn five is typically, you know, when you're going to win. Um, your next Brotherhoods get saved um, for, for that kill turn to give each character that buff of plus two attack. And, uh, you know, moving into turn five, what's really interesting is, you know, if you lay down a resource on turn five, the new Brotherhood actually shuts down because you have you control more than four resources, right? Mm -hmm. and the next brotherhood won't work either obviously because you don't control four or fewer right. so the trick here is to lay scanner or saber tooth face down into your resource row and i bet i know what the answer is going to be so i'm just going to guess it so uh, you recruit your five drop without replace without putting a card from your hand in the resource row right Correct. Yes, uh -huh. that's what it is. Yeah. yeah, I know. I know my buddy Robert plays the Brotherhood deck, and he does that all the time. But I think his deck plays like the Magneto Genosha build. You know, to yeah. get him the four resource, uh, the four resources. And you know what's really interesting is is that's kind of the history of um, the New Brotherhood. Um, and I I think we had somebody um, mention, you know, why not in the the Mega City podcast that we did. Mm -hmm. We had somebody mention why not use, you know, Genosha and the, and the, the five drop Magneto, right? Oh, yeah. And uh, I, I think that. That's the Magneto Eric Lencher from Origins? Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. And, and I think, I think what, what this individual was thinking of was, was this style deck where mm -hmm. we're not really trying to go above turn five. And, and the older version still ran, you know, the New Brotherhood, it ran Blob. It ran Quicksilver to burn them for five, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, it, you know, the New Brotherhood buffed everyone up, but there wasn't really any Reservist. I don't even think Reservist was around during Marvel Origins when, when that deck was popular. Yeah, that um, sounds, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, like, so, I think, I think X-Men is when, it, or not X-Men, uh, Avengers is when it started yeah. becoming popular. Right, right. So what would happen is we would have, you know, Eric uh, Magneto in, and then we would pop Genosha to get our resource count back down to four, from five to four, and that would re- return online the the new brotherhood to give everybody that buff and now you've got a five drop magneto that's getting that two attack buff and uh that can be pretty devastating you know when it when it was back in the day right uh, for sure so uh yeah getting playing your five cost character in your resource row and then using its reserves ability without replacing a card from your hand um that's that's the way to go to keep the new brotherhood and to keep the next brotherhood online and obviously, if you run into Hammer Bay or something like that, that's that's pretty good as well. But turns four and five, that's when you're really going to start using Spore's ability. You're going to start using Anna Marie Cortez's um, ability to shut down combat tricks. Um, Amelia Vo is going to get cheated in a lot. And what's interesting is you know you can only you know you can only keep one character when you know you have a uh, you know two characters that are stunned during the recovery phase. But what's really cool is because this deck cycles so much, you can just choose to get rid of Amelia Vo and then actually just play another one for free, right? From, uh -huh. from your resource row. And then continue on curve with what you were doing. So if, if you've got a good setup and your opponent doesn't have too much disruption, you can actually just use Amelia Vo as that placeholder and continue 
uh, having your character count higher than your opponents, which ultimately is what's going to lead to your victory. Um, this deck, this deck hits really hard. There's really no reason why um, you should not have your opponent killed by turn five, especially if you have an okay start. Right, and actually, um, one thing that I've noticed about the deck too is I noticed that you know you're running the Joanna Cargill and Cargill, whatever, however you pronounce it. <laughs> Um, and you're playing obviously the next, or sorry, the new brotherhood. And, yep. you know, I just want to, that I, it was kind of weird to me. Cause it's like, Oh, why are you playing an ongoing plot twist for a character that gets minus one attack when, you know, well, she gets minus one attack for each face up resource. But if you think about it, when you have the new brotherhood up and her out, let's say that's the only one. Yeah. She loses minus one attack, making her a, or is it minus one attack or minus one attack minus one defense? I forget. It's it's neg one, neg one. It is yeah. neg one. Okay, so you know you do lose the attack for having your ongoing plot twist up, but she gains two attack, so she ends up becoming a seven five. You know, and yep. that's something that I wanted to kind of point out with our viewers if they're like, oh, why are you playing an ongoing plot twist in Joanna? You know, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of weird to have that, but you know, I just wanted to bring that to people's attention as well. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, you also run into, like, Death of the Dream, which is, you know, once they clear the, the New Brotherhood out, um, oh, yeah, you're typically, yeah, typically going to have a back row that's all face down anyway. So Joanna can cap, kind of capitalize on that just a little bit. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, and that's why there's only three copies. Um, it's, it's three Sinyaka, three Joanna Cargill. Um, because of that downside, I don't think that she's worth running four copies of. Um, I, yeah. I definitely, and, and I couldn't really find a, a three cost reservist brotherhood character that, that, that would be better than her mm -hmm. stat wise. So we've, we've kept her for now, but, um, if anyone, I mean, if anyone has a better idea of, of what to run in Joanna's place, I'm definitely open to suggestions and I'm sure you are too. Uh, so drop those in the comments section of the YouTube video for sure. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, I don't know, is there anything else you want to talk about the rotation before we move on? No, not really, man. I mean, this deck's super straightforward, and um, you know that I don't think that we can spend as much time talking about this deck as we would spend with, um, you know, Spider yeah. Stall or, or Mega City. There's just not that many choices. You just slap them in the face, and um, yeah, you know, the, and, the deck is pretty self-explanatory itself. You know, just beat your is. opponent for as much as you can and try to win by turn five. <laughs> yeah, pretty much pretty much okay so why don't we move on to the uh frequently asked questions or faq section of the episode if you if you're done with uh, your rotation yeah let's do it so now we're going to come to our faq section of this episode and the first question on the oh i should say before we get started some of these questions we kind of just come with like we come up with ourselves jacob and i talk before the recording and a lot of these questions are going to be the same as previously, or as mentioned in previous podcasts. So, but if anybody wants to have like qu suggestions for questions that they would like to have answered in future episodes, you know, make sure to leave them in the comments section of the YouTube channel. But with that, we're going to go ahead and start with our first question, which is on a scale from one to ten, how good is this deck? Uh, six or seven. It's it's definitely. Um... Okay. It gets disrupted very easily, the, the deck does. Um, it, especially, you really have to, it's hard to narrow down a meta, so you really have to kind of avoid being Reign of Terror, and you have to um, basically avoid the disruption. But okay. if your friend brings a tabletop brew that doesn't really have um, Gift Wrapped or Reign of Terror or anything like that, um, you are going to punch them through the wall with your deck. It it, it just it slaps so hard, man. I, this deck is nuts uh, okay. when it goes unchecked, for sure. Okay, great. So the second question, what are the good matchups and bad matchups for this deck? Um, the good matchups are going to be um, aggro matchups that aren't as aggressive as yours. You're just, <laughs> you're just gonna you're just gonna uh, throw up all over them. Um, quick voltage. Uh, this deck does really well against quick voltage. Okay. Um, that's you know the flamethrower abuse variant. Um, decks uh, combo decks. This deck tends to get there before the combo goes off. 
So especially combo decks that kind of win on like turn five or turn six, um, this deck does really, really good against. Uh, uh, this deck does good against Combex. Very good against Combex. Um, okay. Combex has a hard time going off. I, I guess we'll probably do a segment on Combex later. Uh, but, and I know um, a lot of people will dread that deck because Exiles get so much flack. <laughs> yeah, and... playgroups are probably going to be upset with us for, for introducing this to, to other players. So I don't know. We I was talking about it with you earlier. We might save that for last, but... It might I, be good. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. I don't know yet. We'll figure. I guess we'll figure out when the time comes. But <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So so you can you can definitely get there um, against Combex. Um, what you know, it, it really any combo deck like that, um, because typically you have this setup where you're playing a very weak one drop, or you're playing many hidden characters, right? Um, decks that run like Ahmed, uh, they typically have a hard time getting off the ground up to turn three. And when you're when you're running this deck TNNB, um, you've typically almost killed them by turn three or four if they're playing, you know, uh, you know if they're if they're just playing like just really low and weak stuff. You, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Um, exactly. So yeah, I- anything that basically takes time to set up is is not very good. Um, I think Mega City when when you play this deck against Mega City. Um, it's it's definitely not as one sided as you would think, especially when you've got um, the Mad Hatter stealing things and stuff like that. Right. Um, Mega City has has a fair chance against it, but it's not a blowout one way or the other. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, but the, some of the bad matchups are are uh, definitely stall decks. I feel like stall decks really came out of the woodworks to combat. Um, so like stall decks, like Spider Stall, for an example. Yeah. Right? Yeah, Spider Stall uh, can really give this deck a very, very hard time. Also, maybe it, also maybe X Stall as well. Mm-hmm. Yep, okay. X Stall as well. Uh, really, any variant of Spider Stall is probably pretty good against this deck. Um, it, there, there's a deck called uh, Black Bamboo. Um, oh, I'm not a, familiar with that one. Oh, okay, this is um, this is the Scroll um, Black Black Bolt is the the one cost. That gets plus one plus one for each affiliation you control. Okay. Um, and then it'll run like hypnotic charms, and then oh. it's it's like an underworld. Um, I think I think that's definitely one of the top eight decks as well, um, depending on kind of what play group and what meta you're in. But um, you know, if you can get that black bolt and get him out in the visible area, and you can get that black bolt well above what you can pump your own characters for, um, the match the game is kind of over. Um, there's just not really a whole lot you can do beyond that. Um, you know, so so essentially, if you want to shut this deck down, um, you know, when you think about cards that are there, that, that'll kind of hurt this deck. When you, when you want to shut this thing down, just run a type of deck that gets your characters above what I can pump them for, or just exhaust my board or disrupt it with Reign of Terror. And that's another one. Crisis Doom has has a really easy time dealing with this deck as well. The the Reign of Terror when you double Reign on turn four, um, it with Doom's Doomstaunt, uh, with the plus three defense, right, and a four and a four drop Doctor Doom, um, that's that's typically over for me. Um, I can't I can't deal with that. Right, gotcha. Okay, so moving on to question three, what are some of the budget options for this deck? Which I know this might be a short question because this deck is pretty budget by itself, with the exception it of is. the Amelia Vaught and uh, the the. Uh, is it the new Brotherhood or the next Brotherhood that's from Marvel Legends? The next Brotherhood. The next Brotherhood. Yeah, with the exception of those two cards. Uh, yeah. So, is there any other budget options for this deck? Well, there was a deck that actually came out of the woodworks um, a, a while back. Um, you know, because we talked about Mega City, right? And we talked mm-hmm. about the budget option for that um, with that Pro Circuit winner. Oh. Okay. Uh, that there was there was another one that was similar to it, um, and it used you know Planet X, the New Brotherhood. It was basically this deck without um, the Marvel Evolution cards and the Marvel Legend cards. Um, mm-hmm. But it was it was Marvel X Men and down. So um, I can provide you with a link of that if you wanted to slap it on the YouTube channel sure. um, in the com- you know. In yeah, the- I can put that in the description if people want to check it out. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that's going to be about as budget as you can get, but the deck still hits hard. Um, you know, even with the budget version, I just don't think that, I don't think that it can compete, um, 
in, in, a, in such a broad golden age spectrum without tempo and without Unisian, the two drop Unisian. The two drop uh, Unisian makes the deck really broken and really difficult to deal with. Um, and obviously the next Brotherhood's it pretty good as well. Right. So gotcha. Um, oh, something I, I didn't mention. Um, you can also take it even further if you really want to go like hardcore budget. And um, you can just run the original Marvel Origins, the new Brotherhood deck from like way back in the day. Um, it it doesn't run any reservist characters, but you know it, it kind of combines Mega City and the new Brotherhood, where it'll run like Blob and then you know the five drop Magneto we talked about earlier with Genosha to draw the extra cards, and it kind of burns your opponent out with Quicksilver and stuff. And does All that does that deck also run Avalon Space Station? I think it might. Okay. Um, I think there's a hybrid build where it'll run it, but for the most part, it tries really hard to just stick with the. I, I think it runs um, War on Humanity. Is is that is that the name of the? It's a Marvel Origins card. It burns your opponent for one. Uh, for that the huge. ongoing plot twist, right? It's like the one with yeah. like Magneto standing, kind of like a little side. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think, I, I think Mystique is in the picture a little bit too, but. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's yeah, it's War on Humanity. Um, that's a good one. Oh, you know what? I think I'm thinking of a different card. I'm thinking of uh, I think it's Global Domination, the one with oh, Magneto, okay. and War on Humanity has Mystique on there. So yeah, I think ah, you're right. Okay. Um, and you know that one will allow you that version will let you let you play Scarlet Witch, which uh, the five the five cost the one that burns your opponent for five when they like activate. use an activated ability or right. something like that. Um, that's that's pretty hardcore too. Um, obviously not as good as this build, but you know, you can go super hardcore budget and I mean, those cards are really inexpensive, man. Super inexpensive. Question four, what are some of the individual cards that hurt this deck? You know, anytime that you can get rid of, uh, the new brotherhood, um, and, and slow us down, um, death of the dream, obviously it, it doesn't kill us, but it, it does set us back a little bit. Reign of Terror really hurts, especially getting double Reign yeah, of Terror. Yeah, you did mention that earlier too when you're talking yeah. about the Doom stuff. So. Um, total Anarchy. Oh, uh, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, Total Anarchy annihilates this deck. Um, and uh, I hope one day to share with you my uh, my X Mental deck. Uh, it runs Total Anarchy just to deal with the next New Brotherhood. Uh, oh, but okay. yeah, Total Anarchy, uh, Makaido Amasha. Can, really? can really slow me down discarding it to stun a one cost character um, especially when you pair it with total anarchy let's see <laughs> absolute <laughs> dominance yeah. <laughs> Which, yes, uh, yep. but I mean I don't in case any of you don't know it's from crisis and ongoing whenever a character costs two or less becomes stun you remove it from the game so kind of like a kind of like a total anarchy with a little bit different twist but man could you imagine if that card was a three cost how good it would be <laughs> oh man i know i know so good but first but honestly total anarchy probably a better card <laughs> uh, total anarchy day. yeah they, i mean they're both fine they're they both there's a lot of cards that maybe people don't really realize that could really hurt this deck um flame trap flame oh, trap right. is really good if you want to Fire. go really janky, Avengers Disassembled. <laughs> <laughs> that is so janky. Uh, oh my yeah. goodness. Um, or as even... we mentioned too, System Failure. <laughs> oh, I hate System Failure. It's yeah. Such I, it's just uh, <laughs> the worst Overload as we mentioned before in a previous episode. Oh, yeah. I mean, once you play with Overload, even though it's banned, it's like when you look at System Failure, you just kind of throw up in your mouth a little bit. Yes, a, a, pot I, a potential future episode, why System Failure is so bad and why you yeah, never play yeah. it. <laughs> I'll, I'll refrain from uh, commenting on System Failure yes. until we can throw that in an yeah. episode. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, so, uh, I mean, there's – man, there's a ton. What's the uh, – I'm I'm drawing a blank on the name, but it's in the what it's in the spider stall deck, the fire star. Oh yeah, yeah hot stuff. Yeah, hot stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, that's a good idea. Stunning all your two drops, you know, hitting a Unissi and Amelia Vo, and then a tempo, you know, on turn five. I mean that mm -hmm. that really slows you down. It really hurts, man. Especially when I go all in and I play like the next Brotherhood to do a global pump, and you respond with flame trapping me. I mean, you can kind of seal the deal from that point. Um. Yeah, because there's no way I can deal with it. It's not like I'm running pathetic attempts or omnipotence in here. The deck doesn't have the room. So any disruption at all. Um, Black Widow, 
uh, the one that team attacks from Avengers that stuns a three drop. Oh yes, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, K- is K- Carol Carol Danvers the four drop? That oh, war- the Warbird. Yeah. That oh, one. she's so good. She's so underrated, man. Mm-hmm. She's so good. What's the three drop Teen Titans? Uh, Cyborg from Marvel or DC Legends? The oh, is it the Vic Stone one? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, you know, he can hurt, but at the same time, though, there's also, you know, all these cards can hurt us, but if you're not running these cards, I can really get in and do some damage. So, I feel like this is the core of what a meta is built around. It's like, oh, you're taking the next New Brotherhood? Oh, I gotta I gotta bring Spider Saul. Well, now we know that Spider Saul and the next New Brotherhood is gonna be in the tournament, right? Mm-hmm. And so then I take my deck to combat that, and then all of a sudden your top four is taken care of of what to expect, you know, when you cut to top eight, you know what I mean? Right. So yeah, that's about the breakdown of, of what, what in individual cards can hurt this deck. And if anybody has any suggestions, I'm sure that I've missed a couple, um, you know, drop them in those comments. Let, let us know what you guys do to, to combat the next new brotherhood. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, I mean, we can't name every single card that's good, oh, but at least we can at least come yeah. up with an idea of, you know, what to look for, but definitely. Okay, so moving down the list of questions. Question five. Do you feel that the Brotherhood team affiliation is the most used and printed Marvel team affiliation? They seem to have so much support in many different sets, like in Marvel Origins, Marvel Legends, the X-Men set, Marvel Evolution, and I don't know if they have any other support. They may. Oh, the starter deck, obviously. It just seems yeah. like to me that they're they're used a lot and they've been the most printed. Do you feel the same way? I do. I do. Um, I, yep. I think... The only yeah. team affiliation that I could think of is maybe X-Men and you know, there's maybe X-Men and Brotherhood are about the same but I, I can't think of any other team affiliations that I feel like has been printed more than Brotherhood, honestly. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think Brotherhood's been printed a lot, and and almost every deck when people try and like you know do homebrews. I mean, you look at Kang, you look at you know Midnight Suns variants, um, you know with uh, with Dagger and stuff. Right. Almost all of them are running Avalon Space Station, Lost City, and they team up with the Brotherhood to get the most out of those power ups. Mm-hmm. Um, I see Brotherhood everywhere. Like when I play versus, um, there's a lot, man. Yeah, that's what I feel. And if anybody thinks that there's any, like, if there's a team affiliation that has been most used or printed, you know, let us know in the comment section as well. Question six. If you were going to make changes, what are the cards that you would, that would be the first to leave this deck? I feel flashbacks from the, uh, from the spider stall three drop when, when I made some people angry about suggesting PTSD. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Boot to the head is pretty terrible. Um, boot to, I, I really don't like boot to the head at, at okay. all. Uh, I don't feel like it brings you as much value as as you deserve when you're piloting a deck like this. Um, the meltdowns are strictly a meta call. Um, they mm-hmm. can go as well. Uh, the hammer bay is like a one of that was suggested to me uh, from one of our from one of our uh, people on my Discord channel. Okay. Um, and and I really liked the idea and I've stuck with it ever since. Um, yeah, Hammer Bay. Hammer Bay is good, but it can also go. Um, and actually, the next Brotherhood. I, I don't. I don't like the next brother. I feel like you can win so many games without the next Brotherhood mm-hmm. that sometimes it's not worth the cost of going to grab it. Because right. what what winds up happening is as I'm cycling through, all of a sudden the next Brotherhood comes into the resource row, and it's taking up a slot um, that should be the new Brotherhood or that should be a Hammer Bay. Or something like that, and so I've had many games where I've had to airstrike the next Brotherhood away because once I flip the next Brotherhood, he's it's there permanently. Meltdown doesn't mm-hmm. get rid of it. Uh, airstrike is only a face down uh, resource. So if you flip any plot twist from your back row that isn't the new Brotherhood or Hammer Bay or Planet X, you're stuck with it forever. Right. And um, when you know that that can seriously be a problem and. You know, that's why those airstrikes are in there in the first place. And so I want to say that the, the next Brotherhood gives us um, gives us value late game, but it does nothing for us early game. Uh, I, I would I would much rather the next Brotherhood be like call down the lightning early game 
to just get the oh, game over with. Um, but you know, it's it's a love hate relationship. I'm not saying it's trash because it's definitely not trash. But when you really crunch the numbers of how much value you're getting off of the next Brotherhood versus um, something else, uh, you know, another you know reservist plus one plot twist that you can do, uh, like call down the lightning or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I I think sometimes the next Brotherhood really underperforms for sure. So those those would be the lineups uh, on the chopping block. Question seven: Why one copy of Barnacle and one copy of Mystic Raven in your deck? Um, I when I first picked up the deck, I didn't. I actually didn't use one copy of Barnacle, one copy of Mystique. I took them out um, to add like another spore or you know something like that. Um, I. Barnacle and Mystique, they they play on each other for the next Brotherhood. So if the next Brotherhood wasn't in the deck, I don't think that you need to run Barnacle or Mystique. Okay. Uh, and you can actually probably cut a scanner and a saber tooth, and then I'll open four slots for another character. Okay. But there's going to be a moment where maybe you have two copies of the next Brotherhood, and so you spend um, turn four maybe. Um, playing or maybe even turn five or turn six playing the barnacle and the mystique to and and like another one cost right like a client stock sure. brothers or something like let's say turn six right you go mystique barnacle client stock brothers joanna cardial because you played sinyaka earlier right okay. um now when you play the next brotherhood or even two copies of the next brotherhood all of a sudden you're getting an insane amount of value per character and I feel like that was better than attempting to stay on curve turns one through five. So the Barnacle and the Mystique kind of um, give you a little bit of variance to uh, how many characters you can drop to do more damage. Ah, huh, okay. That sounds really interesting. And I'm sure that'll be a question that'll be on people's minds. That's why I decided to add it on here. Yeah. But, okay, so our last question, question eight. And as I mentioned before, this is going to be probably a regular question because I just think it's so good. But anyway, if you could allow four copies of one band card for this deck, what would it be? And now, I know before we recorded, before we started recording, you said, oh, it's going to be a surprise. And, you know, uh, I said, I'll be surprised if it's not Dr. Light or Overpower. Or, I'm yeah. sorry, Overload. Um, so, Jake, what is your answer? Dr. Light would be great, but it's not my choice. Um, as for a techie thing, um, I would run Go Down Fighting. I think Go Down Fighting would be awesome in this deck. Go Down Fighting. Okay, I don't remember what that is, so I'll have to probably look it up. And Oh, I, I, I got you. I okay. actually have the card right in front of me. You ready? Okay. So it's it's a one-cost plot to us, um, and target character you control gets plus one attack this attack but you can reveal go down fighting from your hand or resource row. And whenever a brotherhood character you control becomes stunned this turn, you can KO a resource you control. If you do put that character face down in your resource row in its place. So, and, and yeah, that's, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a moment to actually look it up online because I told you you'd be surprised. Yeah, I am. Uh, Hold on. Let me just see. Go down. And, I, and I'll tell you why I would want four copies of Go Down Fighting. Oh, yeah. I remember this. This is from X-Men. That's yeah. Not... Wait, this is banned? Oh, yeah. It's banned. How... Oh, I never... Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the ban list. Yeah, it's, it's oh. banned. Yeah. Okay. Oh. I mean, K or resource or one from the deck. Okay. So, I'm kind of shocked. I mean, maybe... Maybe I didn't really follow it. I never really played this oh, it's card. Okay. So, do you know why it was banned? Um, man, off the top of my head, I I feel like I should know, but I've forgotten. Okay. I've totally forgotten why it was banned. Well, if somebody um, knows, leave it in the comment section. But I mean, I would assume that it has something to do with Amelia Vo and okay. Sinyaka, and I'm I'm sure that there's some ridiculous infinite combo synergy going on. Um, the reason why I would want it in this deck is um because you know we talked about the next brotherhood Uh right um and cards that like so i can't flip boot to the head for my resource row Mm -hmm. i have to play boot to the head for my hand because if boot to the head was flipped from the resource row well now all of a sudden and i i'm i'm pretty sure that this is probably why it got banned 
is because uh, the new brotherhood, you have to have four or less resources you control, right? Mm-hmm. And so with go down fighting, I can flip, obviously the next brotherhood wasn't around at the time, but I can flip the next brotherhood and give everybody plus two attack this turn. And then when someone gets stunned, like Amelia Vo, I can reveal go down fighting for my hand and kill off the next brotherhood that was face up in my resource row and bring Amelia Vo back to my resource row and okay. then re-cheat her in for free. Right. Oh, okay. And so when, when I do that, not only do I get value out of Sinyaka, but playing my plot twist from my back row doesn't tie me down to the new brotherhood of having four or less resources. So I can actually cycle through my stuff faster using go down fighting oh. and get, and get the new brotherhood's multiple copies online Airstrike's not really needed at this point because go down fighting is is infinitely better and can cycle through my stuff like lightning. Right. Okay. Ah, let's see. That's very interesting. So, okay. I think that about wraps it up for this episode. You know, Jacob, thanks a lot for co-hosting this podcast with me. I really appreciate your expertise and your knowledge about all the cards. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. It's It's been a blast. Awesome. Okay, so now the, one of the most important parts of the episode, what are we going to talk about next time? Oh my goodness. Um, I, you know, should we, should we leave it up to the fans of like what, what top eight decks they want to see? Hey, you know what? That sounds like a brilliant idea. So it's gotta be a top eight golden age deck though. It can't be like tier 1.5. We're, we're going to knock out the top eight and then we're going to move on to the awesome 1.5 decks because there's a lot of them yeah that's kind of the 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 structure we have for the episode we talk about the top eight decks and we got three of them so five left so we've already kind of figured out what to talk about but yeah we'll have people in the youtube uh on in the youtube comments uh suggest an idea for the next deck that they want to see i just i just um so i can i can rattle off some off the top of my head just to give viewers like we if they're like oh well i don't really know and we'll actually also ask people in the facebook group what they would like to see as well definitely um so there's 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 a couple that come to mind there's an incredible deck called xbox and it's like a x-men uh weenie rush deck Um, very very good deck um the, the creator of that deck did just such a phenomenal job putting that thing together. Um, that was one of the first and probably one of the only fan made, like, you know, uh, competitive made decks that was, that I feel like was made after the game discontinued that has risen to be one of the best, in my opinion, one of the best decks in, in versus it's so okay. good. Um, Black bamboo, uh, the hypnotic charms, black bolt combo, uh, very, very good deck. Um, I'd like to do Combax last, but I guess yeah. if we have an overwhelming response yeah. of people. Yes, Combax, the Exiles deck, we will save for the very last. <laughs> yeah. And I actually, um, I'm sorry to say that I actually have an Exiles deck myself, so I'm sorry, everybody. And oh, by the way, if we, when we do that deck, I, I will not ask the question if you could allow four copies of one banned card in the deck, what would it be? Because we all know it would be the Blink. So it would. It would. You and I both would agree totally. to that. Um, oh, so man. also some other choices, uh, X mental, right? Is one, is um, X-Mental? Yeah, my, well, I, or is that a know, 1.5 deck? Um, I, so my version of X mental that I've been testing, I feel like it's so close to cutting the, the top eight or the top 10 decks, you know, because there's, there's really no such thing as a top eight in, in golden age. Right. But we're looking at like 10 decks roundabout that are like just consistently better than all the others. Um, and then like, if you were to take that into a tournament, you know, eight out of those 10 are typically what you're going to see, um, you know, in, I mean, we see the same with magic, the gathering and, and mm-hmm. Yu-Gi-Oh and things like that as well. But I have been tweaking an X mental list for a very long time and I feel like it's, it's, it's almost done. So I know a lot of people have, uh, perked interest and I think my list has kind of surfaced around, um, the collective. Okay. Uh, with with a few responses, but I don't want to go out on a limb and say that my deck is like one of the best decks out there. But if we do have an overwhelming, not, not to try to toot your own horn or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, you know, I think it's important to stay humble and stuff. And you know, obviously, I'm not the best deck builder in the world, but I'm telling you, man, this this list is is straight fire. So um, okay, so we'll, what what we'll do is, you know, we'll 
do like your top the top eight decks that we've already planned out that we've talked about we'll go ahead and continue on what order it is you know was still yeah, up still for debate but i also want to say that some other some decks that we may have like in the works is a lot of people requested team titans oh that's a good one yeah and green lantern green lantern's good and fat bat fat bat is fun yes of course all dc decks uh <laughs> but, yeah. um, um i'm surprised we haven't moloids burn have you heard of that deck uh yes i have oh man that deck is so good i a lot of people are like moloids burn no way that's top eight but honestly man like i i i think that it's i think it's really good <laughs> well what yeah so what 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 we'll do is we'll talk about our uh, our competitive top eight deck list, and then once we're done with those, we'll kind of go into the more fun decks that people want to have that want to yeah. listen to. But uh, besides that, I think we're pretty much done. Unless if there's anything else that you want to mention before we sign off here. No, I'm 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 excited to be doing this project with you, and and I'm hoping that this serves the versus community well, and and I'm hoping that everyone's enjoying uh, these podcast episodes. Yeah, definitely. Okay, everyone, thanks for listening. And I don't have anything else to add except uh, we hope you join us for the next episode, which we don't know what deck we're going to talk about yet, so it'll be a mystery. (laughs) So, okay. So thank you very much, everyone, and we will see you all next time. All right, bye, guys.